I think the change can only come from the Spirit of God in your life uh, and, and a change. I think the environment of the third world country or the poverty that you see is a catalyst that helps that change, but affecting true change has to be the Spirit of God. There are distinct differences between a job, a career, and a calling. When I was young, I had a job, which means I was just over broke. When I got into the tax business, I had a career. But when I began to teach, I realized that I had a calling, and it changed everything. I've invited Joe Thompson, my friend, to co-host this very special episode, interviewing an expert in this area to help us illuminate the tools we need to find our calling and live with real purpose. Get ready, my friend. You are about to be inspired. I'm Dr. Nate Sala, and this is a call to leadership. George, so glad to have you on the program today. Joe, thanks for being my wingman. This is such an exciting time because you have, uh, you, you've, you and I have come so far in your journey with your ministry, and I believe it's such an important topic, especially relevant today, where we are facing many issues around the globe and how we respond to the calling that we have in our lives. And so I'd love to share, give the audience a little bit of background first on who you are, why you are here today, what your ministry is all about. Wow, where would I start on that? Uh, Okay, so I grew up as wanting to be a businessman. Uh, I I, everything about uh, my natural giftings is leaning towards a business and negotiations, and so I start off in life, um, you know, owning a small business, growing it, seeing it grow, merging a couple other small businesses into that. Then over time, I had the opportunity late in life to go back and get an MBA, which I did. And then I really finally found my true calling from a secular standpoint, which was uh, change management or turnaround consulting. And I spent the last 10 years uh, flying around the country, going into all kinds of different industries and doing change management, turnaround consulting. Mm. And it was, I was in my element. I just, you know, people say, how do you work 18 hours a day and take seven flights a week and be away from your family five days a week? for 10 years, it's just because, well, first of all, the grace of God and a very understanding wife. (laughs) Mm. And second of all, I was just in my element. I was just having the time of my life. And, uh, but there was always something, something missing. Yeah. Because life was good in terms of our sort of American dream, quote unquote, right? Air quotes, where you had uh, a very fruitful career, right? Respectable wonderful family environment, community of faith. Things were all, all the, all the buckets were full in terms of how we view, like what a good life should look like, right? Uh, Yeah, I mean, it wasn't perfect, but absolutely Mm -hmm. the boxes were checked, you know, solid family career, everything that you mentioned. And so the change wasn't because like I was trying to escape something or a change in life to, to fill something else. It was that literally that uh, through the process, and this kind of backs up to where the ministry started, was, you know, on a mission trip. And uh, the church had advertised a mission trip in 2008. Uh, No expectations, no agenda, no strategy, just were, hey, we're a group of people that are going to go down to this guy we just met (laughs) and see if we can help. And, uh, And we did. And that was the start of something that really, I think, the biggest change changed my heart. Now that was Guatemala? That was Guatemala. So you go down to Guatemala and what were your expectations? Do you have any expectations? Like, because people, there's lots of people who have never been on a mission trip. I've never, I still this day, I've never been on a mission trip, love to go. But you know, you you hear all kinds of different things. What was your, what happened? on that mission trip? Well, I, I did not, I did not have a lot of expectations. I had been on three mission trips prior to that one and each one of them was totally different. So I really didn't have a, a good, clear idea or expectation. And, and, and honestly, the church and the leaders didn't have it either. They were trusting the onsite missionary to, to lead us down a productive path. And, uh, what happened on the trip was we actually ended up moving one gravel pa- pile from one side of this concrete of this construction site to another site 
just so the backhoe could dig a footing. And that's literally what we did all week. And it was from a, from one standpoint, I kind of enjoyed it. And another standpoint, I'm like, let me know. And I would just hire a bulldozer <laughs> to move the chat for me. And, and I could go to Costa Rica. But uh, because you didn't consider that mission work per se. I mean, you considered that just labor work that anyone can do. Exactly. But, but what grabbed me wasn't what we necessarily did during the day. What grabbed me was the people and the purpose mm. of the school, which is now called Brea School, and now how you know now educates 200, 300 kids a year, uh, you know, academically and with Christian values. And so, I just really gravitated towards the on-site missionary, which was incredible. His name was Bill Vasey. Uh, he has a book out now, and uh, he he just really impacted me to the point that I wanted to I wanted to see if I could be more of an impact. No, no, it's really interesting you bring that up because like on the one hand, the, the logical side says, hey, why don't I just send 500 bucks or a thousand bucks down and you can hire five workers to take care of this, right? And then you have some extra cash left over, but there's more to it. I mean, there's more to it than that. There is, and, I, and it's a great point, Nate, because I actually have people that will say to me that, hey, instead of me going, let me just give you $2,000 and you help someone. And I certainly, certainly the money does impact certain people in the poverty uh, environment, but the change happens in your heart when you step on the ground, mm. when you see poverty face to face, when you're faced with it, when you rub shoulders with it, when you sit at the table with it and you see it and that's the heart change that comes. And we've seen people, and I know this might be a little bit of a rabbit trail, but we've seen people in our church and other people that have went on this trip that have maybe been marginal Christians or people that are struggling with their character, you know, dads that struggle with their character and different things have went on this trip and it's been life changing. We had yeah. one trip um, that I remember that we had 11 young people that were at that career age of college and high school and nine of them at the end of the trip committed to do Christian work the rest of their life as a full-time occupation, whether it's a pastor, music leader, or missionary. Mm. And so sometimes you think about like, I got to get my hands dirty and be shoulder to shoulder with someone somewhere far off to really understand even on a minute level where they're, where they are, you know, it's just like, it's easy just to throw money at people. But I mean, that that's convicting to even think about it. So you, so you have this, this was, is it, was it an instant change? Was it a gradual change? I mean, you come home, was it a seed planted? It was definitely, Nate, it was definitely a gradual change. And so that was in 2008, which is, I guess, roughly 14 years ago. And uh, the mechanics of it, we came back. I was all, I was all excited. I, I wanted to go back and experience it again. Um, and what happened was, is then I went to the leader and then they were like, well, we're not interested in doing it, but you could lead the trip. And so in 2009, I put a trip together and I took the youth again. And, you know, I kind of Georgified it. So wait, wait, stop right there. All right. Georgifying it. W when you, was it, I jumped at it. Was it, I was like, whoa, I'm kind of, I have trepidation. Was it, wow, this is what, I've been waiting for. I mean, what was going on in your mind, your heart? What were you feeling? Because that's a big move. I th I think uh, for me, I was ready to jump at it. Um, I had I think I had struggled in life where my where my giftings were, where my ministry was. You know, being someone that's been in the church all my life. You know, I've I've mowed the yard, I've cleaned the toilets, I've I've served on the financial committees. You know, I've had cell groups. You know, I've led Bible studies. You know, I've done a lot of the service, but it never really, you know, like, like this is what I want to do. Mm -hmm. I knew they were good things and they need to be done. But when I had the chance to lead the mission trip, I was just really fired up. Mm -hmm. And my wife and I just embraced it. And we just, we just really turned it into something special. You know, I feel like, you know, by the grace of God, I mean, the uh, first thing I did was take the kids up a volcano and active that, active well it, well, it, 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 it is active in, in, in mount bakaya uh, uh, you can't go up there anymore and uh, uh six months after we took them up there it blew up and and some of the <laughs> effects were unfortunate uh loss of life mm. but um that was just to start with and then we started you know 
uh, on the trip or talking about your question, you know, I, I think that for me, it was something that just felt very natural and it was something I was excited to do. What did you, what did you hope would be outcomes from, from that trip? I think I was really dialed in to the change in the kids' hearts. I was really thinking because my, my daughter was at that same age. Uh, she's probably 16 and my son was 14. And they were at that age where I knew they were making life choices. They were, they were deciding who they were going to become. Mm. And I felt like that if I could impact them as well as 14 other kids, that I could see them change their perspective on the world. And, and I think that was one of the driving factors. Yeah. You know, George, when it comes to helping others, um, I think everyone's capable of helping in, in some way. You know, just look around your own community. Uh, I think it boils down to there's almost a fear of helping because we live in kind of a me society. We don't want our lives to change. Um, how did... Did you never fear fear like going to this place and taking this on, or how did you get past that? Like, what what would you tell other people who are like, hey, you know, I want to help, but I'm just, you know, it's out of my comfort zone. I I don't feel right doing it. Well, excellent point. I I never personally felt the fear. Um, I I was always approaching it like motivating. Uh, I can remember this one particular incident where we were raising funds for a mission trip and the 14 year old girl wanted to go. And the mother just said, absolutely not, not unless dad goes and dad was there. And so I immediately went to the dad and, and started talking to him about the changes. And he really wanted, he was also feeling that he knew that his daughter would be getting at the age of going to college. And now's a good time to kind of have a father daughter time together, some memories and some, depth in their relationship. And so he ended up going and that turned into maybe a 10 year relationship I had with that gentleman that actually impacted the ministry as well as the daughter. Did. So the family support made a huge difference in, in that case. Yeah. Who would you recommend going on a mission trip? Well, um, I spent the week with my mother. She's 80 degree, 80 years old and she has some health issues and she's going. So uh, I don't like to necessarily take someone on a trip that's under 14, uh, but I allow the age to go down a little bit if the parents are convincing in their way of managing that child. So mm -hmm. uh, for me, probably 14 to 80. When you say changes, what, I mean, what kind of changes do you see? Do you see changes in perspective? I mean, I know that we live in an environment, especially here in the West in the U.S., where I mean, entitlement to all kinds of things is it's 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 almost becoming part of the DNA for a lot of a lot of us in the United States. I grew up with, I mean, not only poor, but like the like the opposite of entitlement. I didn't want anyone to do anything for me, and I don't know if it was like I was just stubborn or a combination of things, but I didn't want any handouts growing up. And I always wanted to, quote unquote, be my own man, right? But there's, there's a much different mentality for many who think that, uh, uh, that we don't have it very good here in the United States. And I wonder, I mean, certainly there are people who do not have it good, but I wonder how going to a third world country and serving others can change perspective. Cause I've lived in, I mean, I haven't been on a mission trip, but I've lived in very poor countries as well. And it, and it, it changed my worldview on, wow, I, this is like, I am so fortunate to be in the United States because there's so much more opportunity here than many of the other places that I've been to. Well, uh, Nate, it definitely changes your worldview. Uh, to be in a foreign country, as you as you alluded to, for me, I I think the one week experience for a young person is is an amazing change in in what they're looking. Uh, the only way that I can really communicate that I feel effectively is to 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 mention the results. So, as an example, 
many of the 14-year-olds that were on that first trip in 2009 went on to serve God, you know, and to and to get an education in a in a in an area that they could serve people in the poverty area. For instance, one one girl that's been a big part of the ministry went on that trip, and she went on to study Spanish. She went on to become a school teacher, and now she's working here in St. Louis in a really tough area, and she's really affecting change in that area. And I can think of two or three other people that were a part of that. And so I've seen a lot of dramatic changes, not only in my own life, which has been at the top of the list as far as I'm considered as a change, but even in, in adult men. I've seen one gentleman that went, you know, was struggling with his marriage. He was struggling with his identity, you know, as a man. And uh, that was causing all kinds of rifts with his family. And he decided to go probably for the wrong reasons, probably for adventure, you know. And uh, when he came back, the whole the whole time being with God and being in a foreign country and being around other strong Christians literally changed him uh-huh. to the point when he came back. And he confessed to me years later that it was that mission trip that changed him. And he went on, you know, maybe three or four right after that. And so I've seen a lot of changes by people. And some are minor changes like say, a perspective or a worldview, and others have been dramatic, like, now I'm going to become a doctor and serve in a third world country, or now I'm going to be a teacher and help kids. You know, Nate and I often talk about, um, especially when you listen to a a leader speak or a so-called leader speak, and people have a, you know, they're inspired by it. But inspiration has a tendency to wane over time. And it seems like, as we talk to you about the people who've experienced this, you keep using the word change, not inspired. They were changed. Do you think it's just the magnitude of uh, going there and being hands-on and seeing the people and seeing the results that take it from, hey, I'm inspired to do something to I have this change in my heart? I think that's that's a very insightful comment because I think that I look at inspiration kind of like caffeine. You know, it's a it's a short lived something to get <laughs> like you that. over that. Yeah. You know, hey, I need a cup of coffee to get through the last two hours of my work day or to finish this three hour drive and it's a short term thing where I look at, you know, um the change as something that that changes your entire life. It's it's a one eighty in the road. I was going east, I'm going west now. You know um, and I think the change can only come from the Spirit of God in your life uh, and, and a change. I think the environment of the third world country or the poverty that you see is, is a catalyst that, that helps that change, but, but affecting true change has to be the Spirit of God because we've all seen people that were maybe had trouble with alcohol or other type of addictions, and you very rarely see someone that actually changes. You have, oh, I've been, I've been clean for three months or something, but there's always a gravity to come back because it's maybe they're just being inspired and they're not changing. So you took people on mission trips and there were heart changes, but there was a change so dramatic in you that I don't want to say necessarily on a mission trip, you didn't come back, but eventually you did not come back. <laughs> uh, I'd never heard it put that way, but that's exactly what happened. And, and, and because of probably my, uh, my low IQ and all these other things, it took a long time for that to happen. What would have happened probably with a normal person in a couple of years took, you know, about 10 with me, but no, that's exactly what happened. You know, in 2009, we did a mission trip and, then after leading the first trip, then, you know, sort of my business acumen kicked in. And then I'm like, what's the purpose? What's the strategy? What's our objective? What's our five-year plan? You know, all that starts just running through my veins. And we start checking the boxes on, on that. And then I start communicating with the missionary more often than just, hey, do you got the hotel ready? And are you going to feed us? You know, we're really talking about change in their culture. So now we're talking about change, you know, in a third world culture. And uh, the next year, all my friends in my church said, hey, I'm glad you're taking my kids, but I want to go. And so then I started doing two trips a year. 
and that was in 10 and 11. And then in 2012, we started doing three trips a year because it wasn't enough for me to bring the youth, enough to bring the, the adults. Then I needed a week to kind of prepare for the trips because now I had an agenda, now I had a plan, now I had a strategy, objectives. And that's when we kind of unveiled the ministry was in 2012 that we wanted to, the initial thrust or objective was to, to help widows mm. and, to, and to get them off the street and to, to build an environment for them. And uh, God used our church in that year after that in, in, uh, you know, uh, to say to us, hey, uh, this is great. You're doing all these mission trips, but you're doing a lot of transactions. And so maybe it's time that you create an entity. And that had never crossed my mind. And so I sat down with the group of guys that's now been going for three or four years, my wife and others, and we sit down and we prayed about it. And God just delivered us the scripture, Isaiah 6 and 8. And we started looking at that, and we really wanted something, again, from the business acumen, we really wanted something that communicated a thought. And the thought was that I'm not asking you to do something, that God is asking me, and I'm doing it, and would you come and be a part of it? Now, did you find yourself having to recruit people, or did you find people just kind of gravitating towards... Uh, the excitement around what you were doing? I think it was probably, you know, uh, two thirds people would gravitate towards the excitement of what was going. And then each year we would have the success of the trip. And then there would be a video that would come out and we had a large church. So that would, that would create some excitement. And then I also recruited people as well. When I saw someone to have a specific skill, like, Hey, there's a carpenter over here, or there's a good song leader over here you know, I would also try to recruit. But I would say initially there was a lot of buzz because, you know, young people are not quiet. You know, they're, 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 they come back and they go running up and, hey, 10 people got saved and we brought this little boy a ball and, oh, my gosh, you know, you wouldn't believe it. And next thing you know, uh, my young people were, were my salespeople. And they were, you know, was getting there a everybody. Big social media spread? There from, was a lot of them. I did not even know it until later. In fact, just recently, I'm kind of behind the technological curve here. And I just recently, we opened up a YouTube channel and, and I've got videos I've never seen on trips that I led. I'd never seen the That's videos. Awesome. Yeah. You know? So send me is born. Send me is born. At this time. And what a great call to action. It's very introspective. Right. And it's really this, this, this call to God, right? Send me, right. Is, is, is that how I understand? A absolutely. I mean, the thought process that I view it is, you know, it's a combination of one being called, uh, you have to be a call. And then the second part is that you're responding to that call. And the response is send me. Send me. So you, you, there's so much going on at this time. And, you know, you're fat, fast forward as you continue to move forward and you believe there's, there's so much more that you can do on the ground full time in Guatemala. What is the, I mean, w help us to understand, give us a visual of what's going on, you know, in those communities that is just so heart wrenching, that is just drawing you to leave everything. Well, um, that really comes down to one single weekend. And um, just just a, a little bit of a just a little bit of a um, understanding of how what built up to that. So that was we formed the organization in '01, and then uh, as we were going through there, excuse me, 2011, and as we got to 2014, my heart was to do more evangelism, and I really didn't know how to do it, especially in a foreign country. And so we kind of stumbled through that for about two or three years, doing different things that we thought were effective. When we were introduced to uh, the organization under crew, which is called the Jesus Film, and they they basically have a film that basically is the book of Luke. And I'd heard about it all my life. I didn't know much about it. And so we went down and kind of, again, my business acumen, we were like, okay, everybody's like, well, make a phone call. And I'm like, no, that's not the way. You get on a plane and you go meet them and spend two days talking about it. And so we met with the Jesus Film in Orlando, Florida, and we talked to them about, about evangelizing and, and skipping a culture, a language, and getting the message of Jesus out to them. 
how do we do that and how does that film help us to accomplish that? And we kind of fit a profile they really liked. It was a small language, about 160,000 people. It had only been written since 1978. And the, the missionary with me was the guy that wrote the language. And so they were pretty excited about that. So what normally would take three to five years, they said we could probably do it in three. And I, being kind of who I am, Georgified it, I walked to the board and I said, I'm going to give us 18 months. And um, the, 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 the bill with us that had wrote the language says, I can have the translation done in six weeks. And we finished the film and got it to the Kiche people in 14 months. Oh, my goodness. Which if was, someone listening wanted to see the film, how do they, how well, do they see it? You would go to jesusfilm.org, uh, and then you would, uh, you would choose the languages, and you'd go down to Kiche, which is Q-U-I-C-H-E. So for us neophytes, there's separate dialects? in that region yes so so the obviously latin america speaks primarily spanish and within each country or each area of all the different countries um, there are different dialects and in guatemala i believe there's 28 and quiche is a mayan dialect which there's five of and so this particular dialect i mean you could you could tell a whole story but to to kind of just build up to the event of us going full time, it was it was not even a written language until seventy eight. Oh, and there only there's no movies, and the only books in Quiche are the Bible, which Bill translated. You know, over a forty year period of time when it came out. Ironically, the first time we had a mission trip in two thousand nine. So God brought this all together. So coming back to preparation. In doing the Jesus film with our business acumen, I'm thinking the Jesus film is saying, oh, probably thousands of people will come to know the Lord. And I'm like, well, if we have thousand people coming to know the Lord, how are we going to disciple them? And so we immediately started doing pastor's conferences to kind of bring the, the, the volunteer base and make sure from a theology standpoint, make sure from, you know, just a logistic standpoint, they would be there to help us. So we recruited roughly about 37 pastors. And so we worked for a year and a half while the Jesus film was working on the film and translating the audio to the film. We were working on the logistics of seeing a move of God in that area and seeing these salvations. Are you still working full time? I'm still working about 60 to 80 hours a week. Six. Okay. So yeah, just a little overtime. Yeah. Leave Sunday after church about two o'clock and you get back Friday about midnight yeah. And uh, so my wife was, was basically at that point, she was working full time in the ministry, whether it be accounting or logistics or embroidery or whatever it would take. And so as we built up to that moment in time, that weekend in 2017, um, we received a lot of uh, help, encouragement, training from the Jesus film. They were very instrumental in training us on what to expect, how to do it. And we had the largest by far mission trip. We had 37 people. Uh, the whole church was excited about this event, as well as the people that donated. Uh, each each film is $35,000. And we didn't even know who donated the money. Mm. <laughs> and so we, we got down there on that weekend. And with all that work and with everything that we had done, we started off with three teams of evangelism, we went door to door around the property that we owned at that point in time to promote the film and say, hey, you may not know this, but there's gonna be a film coming out in your language. It's about Jesus and we'd like to invite you to come. And so we saw numerous salvations, including one lady that was a hundred years old um, during that week as we prepared for the, the premiere, if you would, of the movie. Do people know, do, I mean, tell me about, do people know who Jesus is? I mean, do you have to explain? I know in some regions, the, there's no knowledge of Jesus. It's, it's no different, Nate. It's, it's very similar. You, you have people that maybe have went to church. Uh, you have a heavy influence of Catholicism. You have uh, people that don't know anything uh, about, about Jesus or the Word of God. So you have a mixture of people, but most people have a, 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 an understanding. 
uh, of, of them. And so we went to about 60 homes. We're advertising on television. We're putting banners up. You know, we're just doing everything we can do to get this out. And so when it came to... Any opposition along the way? Absolutely none. Absolutely none. In fact, anything we were getting favor huh. uh, in, in the country, Guatemala. And uh, it's very open for the gospel. It's open for change. And, of course, everything is spun in a way that, you know, that you're adding character, that you're developing people. And we try to lean our curriculum that way as well. You know, it's not talk. It's what we're trying to accomplish. And so coming up onto that weekend that I mentioned earlier, you know, on Friday we had a big uh, children's, um, if you would be, party on the land as w- working up to that. And during that party, uh, we had a 1,000 people come out. And if you knew the area, there probably isn't a 1,000 people in the area. So we were we had like four or five buses from in different communities bringing people in, and we had a 1,000 kids on the property. And then that afternoon in the final final preparations of that meeting, we had about 700 salvations of the kids that day. And then uh, two hours later, we set up for the Jesus film to show the Jesus film. And by then, the rain had kind of came, and we lost a lot of people. But we ended up with about 500 adults that stayed. And uh, we showed the Jesus film, and it was just amazing. There was 106 uh, uh, adults accepted the Lord, and we had all 37 pastors there to minister to them. And then that weekend just exploded. Then the next morning, we had a women's conference where there was about 60 women came and we ministered to them and there was several salvations and uh, people that were really working through therapy because the uh, third world's really hard on women mm. down there. Um, and uh, and then we just kept going and we did another premiere uh, on Saturday in the square and same results, about six or 700 people, about 50 people accepted the Lord. And then on Monday, we, we handed a film out to all the pastors and then it started being broadcast on TV on a regular basis. And then um, we were put in the national newspaper. Um, and it was just unbelievable. Wow. What was the moment like when you had the introspective of, hey, I'm evangelizing? Like, I, I've turned that corner from, you know, making that, that, that plan, so to speak, like that business plan, to... I'm, I'm evangelizing. What did that feel like for you personally? I, I think for me, my aha moment came, uh, I had taken two weeks off that week and then the following week. When I got back home uh, as, a common, as a common routine in my house, I opened my suitcase as I traveled every, every, every week for 10 years. And I, would, I transferred my suitcase from Guatemala into my business suitcase and as I was sitting there moving, you know, your cell phone charger over and, you know, all the things that you would do and adding your suit clothes and stuff, it just dawned on me what happened. Mm. And it was just, it was at that moment that, you know, I was thinking that we have as a ministry turned from humanitarian work into, into evangelizing. But the more important thing was that was, that was a culmination of the compassion that had been really slow that I mentioned slow moving in me. And when I saw that, I thought I can't go back to work. I I can't leave all these people that need to know Jesus. Now I can't just put this behind me and say, well, I'll see him in six months. And so that for me was the, the moment that I knew that I needed to make a change because the need was there. When you when you say that, walk us through. I mean, you're looking at people's eyes. What do you see? I see hopelessness. I see that uh, in our area, a generation of people and, and, and of kids that have no future. And by this point in time, you know, I have – you know, we've owned that property for about five years. We had a lot of events on the property and we're very familiar with the kids and you know them by name and you come back year after year and you see there's no change. You know, there's 12 year old kids that don't have teeth. You know, they're not getting fed correctly. The abuse on the women is just intolerable. It, it's just like they, they need help. Yeah. Somebody has to go help them. 
And it was just, again, it was the change in me of understanding the compassion or, or, or having compassion. You know, before I could say, oh, well, you see a postcard, you can say, well, I'll send him 50 bucks and good riddance and I'm back on the road doing my thing. But when you're looking these people in the eye, you know, every couple of months and then you're getting back on a plane to go do your life, I couldn't do it anymore. I couldn't, I couldn't live my life. I had to make a change. Wow. I, I want to touch on, um, the calling, um, from my own personal experience, I, I was cradle Catholic, you know, I was baptized as a baby and I probably heard the term, my calling, my calling thousands of times. And I always thought I understood what that meant. But honestly, until uh, Dr. Sala and I began putting together Great Summit Ministry, up until that point, I I had no calling uh, that felt like a direct uh, interaction between God and myself. And then when I did get it, uh, it was more like a nudge instead of a, a push. Like I, I thought it would be this very like huge moment. Um, but it was just a nudge and it just began with a conversation. And I, I'm interested, like, it's always hard for me to explain that to people now that, that I understood it. How, how would you explain like personally what happened to you? Like, what did that calling like, feel like, you, you know what I mean? Uh, th th did it, did it come as a feeling or was it more like an intellectual, like, Hey, this is something I got to do. Well, I, I think for everybody, it's a little different and it's a great question. And I'll try to, I'll, I'll tell you my version of it, which may not be everybody's version of it. But for me, I think that the calling was there my entire life. And I think that, that even as a young man, as I was serving God and going on mission trips, even like 18, 19, that it was there. But you're 100% right. It is a nudge. And I think I was not hearing or feeling or accepting that nudge. Because it, it takes a little emotional maturity, I think. I, great to, word. To get there. Yeah, ab absolutely. And, well, that's horrible because that came in when I was in my 40s. What does that say about <laughs> well, me? I don't know. <laughs> but, 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 I'm not going to touch on that anymore. <laughs> but but I definitely think it's, it's it, I think you're accurate. Because for me, um, I, was, I was being very successful, and God had given me several options to help in missions, and I literally said the words, God, I can't go help because I'm, I got a business to run. And next thing you know, I didn't have a business anymore. Wow. And so God put me in a spot. And for me, I was driven. I'm embarrassed to mention this to you, but I was, I was driven by greed. And I wanted to, I grew up poor and I wanted to change that. And I felt like the only way I could change that's hard work. And that's the model of my life. And when I got to that point and I got put in a situation, I literally surrendered to the calling sarcastically going, well, I might as well be a missionary now because I can't make that much money anyway. And that was obviously my heart was changing and the sarcasm wasn't the true turning point, but that was just the result of the pressure that I was under, but he got you there, but he Either got way. me there. And yeah. so when I, when I finally, and, and I know we use this phrase a lot in, in the Christian world, surrendered to the call, accepted the call, if you would yeah. be, but I want to go back to your, your, your point of what is the call just a little bit. I want to kind of dig in there a little bit. I believe that the call is your, and I want to get off into a theology issue here, but the, the call is what God has designed you as a person for. So as an example, you may have a pastor that knows theology and he maybe is called to preach in a, in a church in a suburb somewhere and build a, to meet the intellectual needs of, of that congregation. Then there may be uh, a guy like the machine preacher man who went to Africa when they're cutting off the, the hands of all the kids and he was trained by the military and, and, he, and he had a 30 caliber machine gun at the edge of the orphanage. And I could not have had that ministry because 
I was not prepared. I don't know how to load a 30 caliber, you know? And he would, he had mentioned many times how he would fight his way back to the orphanage. Um, and so that's kind of your two extremes. And then, you know, for me, God has put me in a situation where there are amazingly a lot of business decisions and business acumen that has to be in place. And so I don't look at it as a mistake that I spent all my years in business and my training was in business because I am not necessarily the person that's preaching, you know. And so I think that a calling is the perfectly, what you as an individual, what you as your DNA was was created to, to do and serve the Lord. And I believe that God puts you in that. And if you, using the Christian term, you surrender, you accept that call, you fill out your application, <laughs> email it to God and say, I'm, I'm on board, I'll accept. Then that's where you are accepting the call. You work in your natural gifting. And that is where the peace of God comes. And that's where you understand this is where I'm supposed to be. This is what I'm supposed to be doing. And it takes discovery. Absolutely. I mean, it starts with discovery. And it's very rare that, you know, a 19-year-old says, God's called me to be a teacher in Ethiopia, and I'm going to go to school. And at 28, I'm going to go through theology classes. I'm going to go there and serve as a missionary. That's a very rare person. That's Bill. That's that's the guy that, that has helped me on the mission field that we've kind of walked behind. He's that guy. At 13, he knew he was going to be a missionary, went to linguistics at Wheaton College, idled himself off of the, the saint, that, you know, the situation that happened in the 50s in Ecuador, you know, of the five uh, guys that were killed there. And that's what was his idol, and that's what he went after. And he knew he was going to be a missionary all his life. But that's a very rare thing. Like you said, Nate, it's discovery. Yeah. And I think, you know, uh, for me, you know, I discovered it in my late, late 40s, and now I'm walking it out in my late 50s. And there's a discovery of your natural gifts. Absolutely. I think, uh, I think people walking around thinking they're incapable, you know, of these kind of things, um, just haven't really discovered their, their natural gifts. And I think there's a, a place, e- even if it's not along the evangelistic lines, but a place in humanitarian work uh, for a whole plethora of different kind of gifts that people are, are endowed with. Absolutely. And you don't know to have some of those develops until you walk in them. And I think, you know, kind of circling this with the wagons here a little bit, I think that's a lot of what mission trips can kind of help accelerate that process. Kind of shake it out of you a little bit. Uh, I love that term. Yeah. That, that, that you can see, oh, I can see how I can minister here, or I could see how that I, uh, there's several of the young people went on these trips and they've went back and they, what should I do, George? I'm like, go to medical school. <laughs> you know, they're like, they're, they think I'm going to say, you know, pack my bag and come back and dig ditches. No, we can get anybody to dig a ditch, you know, go to medical school, That's you great. know, go become a nurse, go become a linguistics person, go be a law, an international lawyer. That's what I need. You know, anybody's listening to this, want to know what to do, go be a lawyer and then re- report in, in about six years, you know, uh, so God needs strong people in these areas to build, to, to, to do the work and, and to see, to see true change effect takes some level of communication with foreign governments and to be able to communicate with, uh, politics, especially in the world of corruption and to be able to walk that line of respect, but not being tainted by the world in the process. That's some, that's not your average duck. No. No, it's not. Especially what you're seeing today. I mean, the news has, uh, you can go on any channel and see the border challenges we have right now. People leaving many of these countries looking for a better life, right? And uh, it's heart-wrenching. It's heartbreaking to see how difficult people have it in other places to where they they just, all they want to do is just have dignity and a comfort any, and and the, just the basics of life. And that's what you're, you're seeking to provide. Absolutely. The, you know, we're trying to create even, you know, even a type of economy over there that's happening kind of slow, you know, through education and jobs. And, of course, I see it from the other side of the fence, literally the other side of the fence, um, that they're leaving Hoyava and they're making the track 
you know, through Guatemala, up through Mexico, and then across the Rio Grande. And, uh, you know, of course, as an American or as someone that understands the rule of law, you know, I'm against illegal crossing, you know, borders and, and just the whole idea of that. But I also, from a compassion standpoint, see the cruelty in the system down there that there literally is situations and where there is no win. And we as Americans or Westerners don't see that a lot because you can take anybody typically – I'll say anybody, let's say 95% of someone that lives here in the U.S., and if they work hard enough and educate themselves, they can get ahead. It's almost guaranteed. But over there, it's not, you know, in a, in a third world country, even Mexico and, and Guatemala and El Salvador and Nicaragua, that you can't, there's, you can work hard and all you do is get that day's pay. And there's not a GM to go to work for and develop a pension. There's no loans for schools. There's no social programs for someone that has, you know, uh, babies out of wedlock. I mean, everything is stacked against you. And they believe, um, which I'm against, but they believe the many times the only solution is to pack up and come to America, work a $15 an hour job and send seven of that back to their family. And, and that's their response, which I don't believe is God's perfect will. But it is a response. I think it's easy to look from this side of the Rio Grande and say, you know, hey, what are these people doing? But look at the things that even we as Westerners will do in order to support our families and that when things get uh, going hard. I mean, um, you can look around at society and you can see kind of there's an underbelly to everything. Uh, there's not much difference in the mindset uh, to me for someone who will maybe do something illegal, you know, to earn money or however it is in, in the Western world, as it is for people to seek, you know, to, to uh, solitude and to get away from that. And I know Nate and I have talked about um, we should view this as an opportunity like this is an opportunity for us to, you know, bring the word of God to, to people. And, you know, you're on, you're at ground zero, really trying to, I mean, what you're doing uh, by creating opportunities is far greater to help that problem than anything politically or socially, you, you know, you can, you can do like if you want um, people to stay in, in their country, then they need opportunities. They need a chance to change and grow. And that's the importance of these, these missions. Uh, for, for sure. You, you know, you can't affect change by uh, building a wall. I'd be in favor of building a wall, but, but that doesn't affect change. And I think another perspective can be for Americans is, is the understanding of the rule of law. We, maybe you're not familiar with that term, but that's built into everything in our culture is the rule of law. Hey, 55, if you go 60, you get a ticket. You know, if you jaywalk, you get a you're ticket. You're dating yourself now. You know that, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you, 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 you and know, Sammy Hagar. Right? You, you, know, uh, you, you, you know, there's, there's, a, there's an absolute if you would be. Right. You know, but from, from the Guatemala standpoint... There's no rule of law. So when I, as a pious, red-blooded American, say, well, you broke the law, you entered my country illegally, that they can't even wrap their head around that. doesn't register. Because, number one, uh, Nicaragua and El Salvador, the two bordering countries, don't even have borders. So there's no border control. So you can come and go without a thought. And number two, they don't understand the rule of law because the policemen in Guatemala are, are typically on the take. And so the only reason that you're going to stop and talk to a policeman is to pay a bribe. Uh, and this is a business. And I mean, let's talk yes. about that. The, and, and this would be a, a business within a business or a, the definition of corruption, if you would be. I mean, are there like billboards, hey, we'll get you across the country? I mean, is it that much of a business? I mean, how there, deep does it go? There, there is. There is. There's border. There's there's billboards on both sides. There's there's um, there's advertisements on on our television channel in the town I live, advertising, go to America, call 
coyote or whatever. Wow. And on on our side of the fence, on, on the United States side of the fence, on these tracks that they take, which I don't know the actual location of it, but I think it's through mainly new, through New Mexico, the mountains, there's actually billboard after billboard saying, write this number down, type this into your phone and call us when you get to a payphone. We'll come and pick you up bring you to Pennsylvania or Iowa or wherever, and you'll go to work for us and we have housing for you and you'll immediately get a job. No identification necessary. So it's making it really easy for them. And, and to your point, it is a business. Wow. And so what then do you do on your end in your ministry to, I don't want to say keep people there, but to create a better sense of life? What what are what's going on in your camp? Right I now? think I think there's a couple things that we do to address that. Now there's a couple plans we have to actually move the dial on that, and then the other part of it, we're responding to the need of the vacuum of all the men leaving. Because so that's a natural. So yeah, effect. because that's a natural effect, and that's that's unfortunately, you know, for me, that's a little bit more on my uh, front of my agenda because, you know, I walk into um, kids that aren't going to school. In fact, I got a call today of two kids that want to go to college um, that I'm probably going to help fund them to go to college, but I got to make sure that they're going to keep good grades and put some checks and balances in place. But you're, you're dealing with the aftermath of all these men leaving our area, maybe as high as 60%. And so when we're going to the country, you got widows that don't have food, you got kids that are not being educated. You got young women that are being preyed upon. Uh, you just have a slew of problems, and and so we're dealing with that from a standpoint of relief, if you would be. And that's one step. That's kind of like your first step in poverty, and then you from relief is the first step, and the next step is the the development or the planning of how you're going to get them out of poverty. And that would be maybe an education or one one case we're having a, helping a girl fund her to start a little store they call it Tiana. Another plan might be to go to school, you know, and then what's that other side to look at? What are the habits that you have to change to get out of that? Uh, that's what we're doing from the relief standpoint or to, to address the vacuum of the, say, 60% of the people leaving. But to address them actually leaving. I mean, in a small case, I've talked one Christian family out of him leaving. He was going to leave. And I had to be very blunt with him. You know, what are you going to do? You're going to leave your wife. She's a young woman. You got two kids. Now you're going to go over there. You're going to be over there for five years. The typical will happen is they pick up another woman and then they have another family. They're not bad people. It just, it's a part of nature. And then they get deported and then they go back to their original family, leaving a broken family in the United States. It's just a cycle of poverty wow. that just is horrible on the family unit and women and children really are at the bottom of that. The one idea that I've been working on and I have got it off the implementation table and into, into uh, working has been a vocational school. Um, down there, because a lot of them are not savvy academically, that the vocational makes a lot of sense because they're very entrepreneurial and they're very hardworking and they're very mechanical. And so we started, uh, we started three different classes. We started uh, a chef school, which was the most popular motorcycle was the second and then Modesto or sewing was the third. And so we, we funded the equipment and we, we developed a relationship with the local vocational, um, program and then that was they were able to come and serve and we were at, I I taught a change of behavior curriculum and because I thought it's no good for them to learn how to fix a motorcycle if they still can't manage their money or they still don't plan and so you know I was trying to teach them concepts and we're developing that into something we call plan de vila or in English it would be called a plan for life and so the plan for life is you know setting down what are you going to do this year next year what you need to do to accomplish that just basic things that our kids learn in junior high here wow. and that's one of the things that we're trying to do to change that but right now it's on a small scale but it's also in the proofing stage where we're proofing the concept of what changes and teaching them about expectations you, because uh if i can this one last point is really critical is 
one of the things that's missing, it's easy to identify like the academic portion, but the one thing that you don't see right away, and unless I was living there, I wouldn't have caught on to this, is there's no mental toughness. So that's one of the biggest attributes identified when I taught at the vocational school was that the minute they have a problem, they give up. Mm. So the idea of working through the problem, and there's there's little to no problems uh, solving skills. So I know that's a bigger issue, but I just addressed the one issue I felt like I could move the dial on was was the mental toughness, was explaining that, yeah, you go to school, maybe you fell, or maybe you fell a class, or, you know, but they would, to the point of, like, if it rained, they would give up on school. Mm-hmm. And so teaching that attribute that I think is driven into us as Westerners, you know, through all kinds of different methods is probably one of the biggest gifts that we can give to them is a mental toughness to know that you can, you can accomplish something and you have to accomplish it by working hard and having a goal and setting expectations. You know, just sharing that some of these, what we call basics uh, on that level is it's really humbling to even think that, you know, where, where you have to start. I mean, you and I have had conversations around cognition I mean, just synapses firing. I mean, where do you, I mean, you find that you've got to even start in places that are so extremely ground level to, to just help people. I mean, just tiny, tiny steps. Well, one of the things that's so challenging and one of the things that we've learned because we've, we've had uh, kids living with us for three years, we took in from the hospital, abandoned kids that we took in and it's really taught us exactly what you just described from our past conversations is with the young kids, it's more obvious because they're, they're more vulnerable and they're more communicative and they don't have to hide anything. So if you ask them a question, they just answer the question. And so you can get to the facts matter, but what's, what is happening over there is, is through this, what, what you mentioned is the fact is, is that because of a trauma and B nutrition or the lack thereof, you don't have the synopsis. You don't have that quick call memory. You don't have that short-term memory or that path that, that creates that ability to memorize something like two times two, four times four, whatever. And they, they are having trouble with that. And we originally thought, you know, that we're dealing with like special needs kids. But what we found out, it's the trauma and or the nutrition and they can work hand in hand. And sometimes you get both, sometimes you get one. And, and so, you know, when I'm dealing with, when I was in the vocational school and I'm teaching with, and these are probably the upper crust of the kids and I'm teaching kids 22 to 28 and they can't memorize, they can't do simple math in their head or simple multiplication. And when I was teaching them Excel, they could, very few could even get the concept of multiplying a cell against another cell you know, something that you're not looking at like the components of Excel, but just looking at doing a problem. And so you you have to go way back in education to get to the ground level, (laughs) to build to ground zero, if you would be, of what, why they're not able to learn. And so you, you have to dig back that. And that's, that's why we're going to that standpoint of, of trying to do what we call is a plan to vila or plan for life for each person we're ministering to because sometimes there's psychology involved sometimes there's nutrition involved to really get to the cause and to affect change you know if you want to be inspired i'm not being flippant i guess i am give them a hamburger you know give them a bag of rice and then leave them because it absolutely does nothing but if you want to affect change it is a long-term you know, relationship with them that may be five or 10 years. I'm three years into the kids in our house and we're just now seeing true transformation of lives, both spiritually and natural academically thought process, problem solving. Is there an opportunity for adoption for Westerners? It is tough for Americans because Mm -hmm. it was misused in the nineties Mm-hmm. And uh, and there was a lot of kids that were taken out of the country, and Guatemala responded with tighter restrictions. It's not impossible, but it is very difficult. Mm-hmm. And as we even look forward to developing, you know, an orphanage uh, as well, it's very difficult because of the abuses in the past. Um, but it is possible. George, how do people find you? Well. 
our address on the web is sendme.org, and you can contact me through email, which is simply george at sendme.org. Awesome. Hey, George, I'm going to put you on the spot. Not that I haven't already, (laughs) but eventually we'll each be on that great summit, that very top of the mountain where the end of our life is, uh, is before us and everything that we've accomplished is, is beneath us. How would you describe in memory of George Roller? Wow. I think it's the tale of two lives. It's the tale of a life that pursued my own ambitions, uh, what I would believe was success. And it's the tale or act two of George following a calling of God. And this is the second act. And so uh, I wish I had the energy and the strength I had in the first act. But the fulfillment comes, uh, the feeling of getting on a plane Sunday and going back to the ministry that God has inspired is just an amazing, uh, uh, it's an amazing thought. And I just feel like I tell a lot of people, our donors and supporters, that I have the greatest privilege in the world to build a stand in front of these people and see an effect change, whether it's the Spirit of God, whether it's a bag of grain, whether it's offering a scholarship to go to school and change their life forever. I mean, think about it. Change their life forever. And I feel like that, uh, you know, if you were standing... uh, on my uh, on my grave that that's what it would be that you would say well he served himself for 40 some odd years and then he served god for hopefully more than 19 <laughs> <laughs> in a way that 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 god has blessed and god has blessed it and i feel like that i haven't done much other than answer the call of isaiah 6 and 8 hear my lord send me george we are definitely on your way. Thank you, brother. Thank you for joining us. What not only an inspiring, but hopefully a motivating and moving discussion that I know will speak to someone today. Thanks for the time. You bet. Joe, thanks, thanks, thanks for co-piloting, yeah, thanks brother. For, thanks for having me. I couldn't have been in here with a better guest. You're awesome. You're an amazing guy. And we appreciate all the things that you do. Thank you guys so much. All right. Molly.